So, Jack Cruz, good to see you again, my man. Thanks for coming back on the show. Good to see you, too. Dude, Glad to be here. Yeah, you were, I think you were my second or third guest when I started this thing a year ago. And uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on back then when I was uh, virtually an unknown podcaster. In the past year, I've grown quite a bit um, and uh, largely due to some of the great people like you that came on in the beginning and gave me some leverage and credibility. So thanks again, dude. No problem. Anytime. But you didn't need me. You already got a lot of credibility. Ah, thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, it's been good. We're up to uh, almost 600,000 downloads in the, in the first year. So we're we're coming along slowly but surely. It's been really That's awesome. fun. Yeah. So enough about me. What's going on in the life of uh, Jack Cruz at the moment? What are you excited about? What's going on in your career, your discoveries? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm still on the, the path for uh, biohacking. I, I have had a pretty big discovery towards the end of uh, 2016, beginning of 2017, that um, all the things that I rail on about to both my members and um, to people on different podcasts, I, I realized that I'm up against my own heteroplasmy rate because of my job. I mean, you know, And you know my day job is being a neurosurgeon. And one of the things about being a neurosurgeon that is a really difficult thing to overcome is that we have to take call. And when we're on call, that means this stupid thing right here goes off at all, all hours of the night and then we have to respond. And when we respond, it's usually in a blue lit environment filled with non native EMF. So when oh, you man. do this between seven and 10 nights a month, um, it becomes a, a real big issue. And for I've been doing some pretty crazy hacks for since 2014. And I've come to the realization about, I would say probably about eight months ago that I was going to have to change the way I did business, you know, in my day job. And I've been actively moving towards that trend of being able to figure out how to outsource uh, being on call in neurosurgery. And just so you know that, I'm trying to explain this to you as best I can. That would be Luke trying to say, well, that's like living your life by outsourcing oxygen. So it's that kind of level of difficulty. And it's taken a good year to kind of get it squared away. But I would say that I'm like 99.9% .9 there. So uh, my goal was to have it done by July 1st. And it looks like I'm going to, you know, hit that, that goal. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a long process. Um, but I'm excited because I may never have to take another day of call the rest of my life. So that's 27 years, you know, of doing this. So I'm kind of, you caught me at a really good time. You know, oh. it's, 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 it's uh, something I've been really looking forward to, you know, and I've been sharing that information with my friends. In fact, I just came back from, from meeting one of my buddies because he said, look, tell me what's going on. And uh, I kind of, let the rabbit out of the bag. So you're about the second or third person I've talked to about it. Good for you, man. Good for you. That's, you know, at a, at a point in, in, in our lives, I think that self care really starts to become important. You know, I was in the fashion industry for 19 years and after, you know, I don't know, I guess it's been about a year and a half. It was just like, dude, I can't drive around in LA traffic for 12 hours a day anymore. <laughs> You know, right. It's like there's a lot of benefit in having that career. You make money. You know, it's fun. It's creative. There, I'm sure like, you know, you enjoy your job, but it's like at what price at a certain point, you know, you do come up. That's the, that's exactly the point that I would make to you is that, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s. I'm in technically my sixth decade now. And the way, you know, this non-native EMF and, and biophysics works, that every 10 years we age, our heteroplasmy rate goes up. Well, here's the thing. When you have a blue lit life and a non-native EMF life, kind of like I do, that's why I have to do extraordinary things to mitigate my risk. And I've been doing a really good job up until I'd say the last three or four years. And it, I always thought it was the social media aspect, you know, the podcasts and this and that. And it turned out after Ruben and I made the Quantlet, uh, I figured out probably in about three or four months that it actually wasn't that, it was actually my job. And you wanna talk about a big swift kick in the balls? Dude, you know, it's kinda of like what I tell everybody else, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, you know, 
um, you know, in true Jack Cruz form, what do I do? I jump off the cliff without wings and I make it happen. <laughs> and, you know, just like anything else, Luke, you know, you, you can never plan for all the contingencies. But like I said, you caught me right at the right time. If you would have talked to me six, seven, eight months ago, uh, I was in the process, you know, the, the hardcore process of doing this. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty stoked right now and I'm going to be able to do neurosurgery during daytime hours. I'm not going to have to work on weekends. I'm not going to have to take call. So from my standpoint, dude, it couldn't get any better. The only thing that would be better is if Hurricane Cindy here gets out of my backyard. <laughs> right, right. So uh, for, the, for those of, of us listening that aren't, you know, like from, from a layman's point of view, what exactly does a neurosurgeon do? Does that mean that you carve open people's skull with a saw and get in there and mess with their brain? Yeah, I do that. The other thing neurosurgeons do is they operate on all aspects of the spine. So like when people break their spine in two and they're paralyzed, I take care of that. Uh, the other thing we do is we take care of peripheral nerve injuries. So if anybody happens to be a fan of NFL football and they're a Dallas Cowboy fan, there's a football player there named Jalen Smith they drafted last year. He had foot drop after having a, uh, you know, a knee injury. I take care of stuff like that. Um, you know, whether it's, whether it requires surgery or not, uh, we do that. You know, the simplest thing is like a carpal tunnel, which, you know, most people know about. But I can do all things from the ultimate complex, like if you get stabbed in the neck and all your nerves coming out of your spinal cord going down your arm don't work, that's called the brachial plexus injury. Um, I fix those too. So anything that has to do with the central and peripheral nervous system, whether it's surgery, and most of, it's, most of it is surgery, but even non-surgical stuff, that's the kind of stuff I do. So I reconstruct a lot of spines, both necks, thoracic, and lumbar spines. And, you know, some of the, the crazy thing is what we we're talking about earlier. I may not have to do the big crunch injuries anymore because a lot of that stuff comes in at nighttime when people are out, you know, doing shit they're not supposed to be doing. And they come in with, you know, hellacious injuries and we have to put them back together again. And that's kind of the thing I'm trying to move away from. While it was great when I was in my 20s, 30s and 40s um, and even early in my 50s. It's one of the things that takes a toll on the surgeon. You know, you, you do this to help the patient, but I don't think a lot of times that the lay public and, and, and patients realize that the doctor also puts himself at risk by doing this. And, you know, on top of this, you know that when we do that kind of surgery, especially when we're putting spines together, we're around x-ray machines and floral machines, which I think everybody knows is not good for you. And when that makes up a, a predominant part of your practice, that's when you have to start to think about yourself because you know one of the things i tell my members and i'm going to share this with you because i think you'll appreciate it especially is who the hell are you good for if you're not good enough for yourself and that is my come to jesus moment in 2016 and that's when i said you know what 2017 is the year that i have to fix this problem in my life yeah yeah and, and that's the big that's the big ticket so when you talk about you know, to, to your audience and your members of your tribe and your website and all that, they know what non-native EMF is and what bad LED and fluorescent lighting is. Could you give us a breakdown of what you mean by this EMF exposure that you're getting? Because I know subjectively, I was just at the dentist a couple of days ago. They lay me back in the chair. I look up and they have those like sort of a uh, round encased metal, you know, reflective light fixtures with these long tube LED or fluorescent lights in there. And I look up and it just like hurts my brain. You know, it's like I immediately know I'm in an environment that is not healthy. And I look around at, you know, these guys are in there all day, man. There's very little natural light. And if there is, it's coming through a window, which is blocking, you know, the spectrum of the some spectrums of the light that are actually good. So what what is it about that environment that's bad for someone that doesn't understand how this stuff works? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. This one is, is easy. Our cells are optimized to work with sunlight, and that carries frequencies from 250 up to 780. Um, the issue is anything that's outside of that is a real problem uh, for us. So since we're talking on Skype, I'm going to send you a little picture so that if you want to put this in the show notes afterwards, I want oh, you to great. take a look at that picture awesome. on the side there, Luke, and you'll see – that the visible part of the spectrum is right where it is, and then you have the, the extreme low frequency end, which is the Schumann resonance. Everything that's between 
those two is non-native EMF, and that's what we use to communicate. But what people don't realize is when the incident ray, the incident electromagnetic ray comes in, our cells are optimized for things only within the spectrum that's present on Earth. So man has figured out how to do what me and you are doing now. How can you be in uh, California, me be in Louisiana? Because we're using RF and microwaves, which are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but not part that biology is optimized to. So when you build a life around the other parts of the spectrum outside of the sun, that's when you have a problem. And, and that ties directly to how we open this podcast. That's really what my job has put me at risk for. Because, you know, being a neurosurgeon 27 years ago, I didn't have a lot of those risks. Like when we used to do certain types of surgery, I wasn't around a lot of that stuff. Now in the modern operating room, dude, I can't get away from it. So it's like being in Chernobyl nuclear reactor when you're with somebody. And when you do this constantly every single day, you know, you're building up. Uh, uh, a toxicity to it. And that toxicity has got a special name called heteroplasmy. And what heteroplasmy is, for those of you who don't know, we have respiratory proteins on in our mitochondria. And it's called cytochrome 1, 2, 3, and 4. The other one is number 5, which is the ATPase. And heteroplasmy is very simple to understand. Normally, the things are supposed to be this close together. Heteroplasmy means it's like that. So when that happens, remember what channels across? There's electrons. Physics says the closer things are together, the easier energy transfers. Well, if it's further apart, that means that you're losing energy in the system. And when that happens, you get sick. And that's the key. And it's that simple. The sun is optimized to work with our cells and our mitochondria. So that's why we call it native, because it's native to the earth. And we evolved on this planet. Therefore, everything that's outside of that 250 to 780 window is what we call no bueno in my, in right. my, okay. In hence, my hence non-native. So yeah. So and like when I come in my office slash podcast studio here, for example, um, I have a couple sort of amber incandescent bulbs that I usually keep it lit with, which is really nice. But if I need more light, I only have one option and that's this led light that's in my overhead fan. And when I turn that thing on again, like I was saying at the dentist office, it hurts my eyes and it literally like hurts my brain. And so what you're saying is, is that LED light has such a narrow, unnatural spectrum of light that my brain and an optic nerve or literally doesn't know what to make of that. It's like, what, right. the, what the fuck is that light? We don't right. know what that is. And so it sort well, of scrambles your, your system, so to speak. Is that kind of right? Well, it's, it's actually even simpler than that. I, mean, I like the way you described it, but what I want people to understand, because it's really cool, I'm going to send you another picture probably later on that you can use in the show notes. But what people don't realize, when the sun rises in the morning, equal amounts of blue and red are present. There's other frequencies, but the one frequency that's not present is UVA and UVB. Why? Because that comes a little bit later unless you're on the equator. So here's the take home. Blue light from native situation, meaning the sun, is always balanced by red. So it turns out, guess what runs all the regeneration programs in us? the red. So you're never designed to see blue by itself. So you just mentioned a really cool bulb and incandescent. The reason why we didn't see spikes in mitochondrial diseases from 1879 up until about 1980 is because incandescents were the primary bulb we used. And believe it or not, they have red in them. Not a lot, not like the sun. This, for those of your listeners who don't know, 42% of sunlight is infrared A. So that means 42% of sunlight has the regeneration protocol. So for those of you who don't know this, there's a whole section on PubMed called photobiomodulation or LLLT, which is the science of red light. And it turns out one of those cytochromes in a mitochondria, it's called cytochrome C oxidase, and it has four absorption spectrums. And guess what they are? All in the red. What's the other big red chromophore in the body? Water. So all of a sudden, then you start to see how the system works. So anytime you have blue, you've got to have red with it. And sunlight never comes with blue without red. So that's how you start to understand why modern technology really destroys us. And I think most of your listeners probably know that chronic blue light has been well shown in the literature to destroy melatonin. Well, we all know that when we don't sleep, we can't regenerate. But now you know the real reasons why. It's because 
you've subtracted the red from your life. So what do I teach my tribe and my misfits? How to add back purple and red into your life because purple is UV and red is the infrared. And it turns out all the modern bulbs, specifically LEDs and fluorescents, have subtracted out the purple and the red. Why? Because they're energy efficient. And that's from the power company and your wallet's perspective. But here's the flip side. It costs a shit ton more to come to me as the nurse. Exactly. Than it does to pay PG&E. Exactly. Okay? Exactly. And that's, what we, that's the message really that I'm trying to get across to people that we are, we are being penny wise and pound foolish with our decisions on light. Right. So same thing with, with people that are like, oh, I'm not going to go to Whole Foods and buy organic food because it's too expensive. I'll go to Costco and get the GMO pesticide shit. They don't realize that they're going to have to pay for chemo, uh, cardiologist, et cetera, dialysis, all this shit later on. Especially when they're under blue light and do this. That's that's the real kicker. I mean, you know that one of the things that I'm a stickler about is food is not the top priority for me. The top priority for me is getting your light environment right. Because if you do that, you can almost eat shit on a shingle and get away with it. And I know that's contrary to the message that a lot of people give, but that's how incredibly important understanding light really is. And it really is powerful. I would I tell people that if you can get in natural sunlight, you'll be doing more benefit for yourself than you could ever imagine um, that's earthly possible. Then you fix the other problems, like the water that we've talked about before in previous podcasts and the food issue. But I've got to get people's focus on the thing that matters the most. And it turns out that sunlight is that big issue. So let's so let's start with the with the indoor lighting. In your opinion, in terms of the types of bulbs that we can light our homes with, what's the hierarchy in terms of like how I would look at it would be fluorescent worst then LED, then halogen, uh, then uh, incandescent. What, yeah, what's uh, your what's your take? Backwards? LED is by far the worst. Holy it's not shit, even... it's worse than fluorescent? Yeah, it is. Now, wow. fluorescent has a couple of other issues. And I, I'm actually looking on my computer right now to send you a picture to prove you why that's the case because I do want you to link it in the show notes. Okay. But the key, key thing is the LEDs are by far the worst. And the reason why is they have a big spike between 435 and 465, is, which is what destroys melatonin. Uh. Uh, the, the fluorescents have other issues, but uh, they're, they're equally as bad. If you ask me, let, instead of focusing on what's bad, let's focus in on what's good. What I do in my house at nighttime, post-sunset, I use fire. So I'm a big believer in having natural fireplaces. Now, I know when you live in L.A., that's pretty freaking hard to do. <laughs> yeah. uh, your AC but, bill would definitely be pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing you can do though is you can put your fire pit outside and, and live an outdoor life. That's one of the cool things about LA that you can get away with. Um, it turns out I can do the same thing here. Now, when I do come inside, because you know it is pretty hot here, even though we're going through this Hurricane Cindy crap, um, it's probably 93, 94 degrees here, and the humidity is over 95 percent. Wow. So. The, the key issue, and here comes that picture. I just found it. Oh, cool. It's one of my little Instagram quotes, but you see on that picture I sent you, it shows you the spectrum. The back spectrum is the one of sunlight, and the front spectrum is the one of fluorescence. But the key thing that you need to understand about light, the best one is fire, as far as I'm concerned. So one of the cool things, because you used to be a, style, a stylist, um, and you still do stuff like that, I would tell you – I. You know I have a big wine collection, and I can actually show this to you right now because I have one in front of me. This is a bottle of 99 Grange, and you notice that I have a wick inside of it, and it's got some lamp oil. So this is what I use at night. So people who are watching this are seeing, I just pulled this right off of my coffee table. So here is a 1995 Mouton Rothschild. For those of you who don't believe, there's the label, and look what's in the top. That's wild. This is called the Vino Glow. So at nighttime, this is what my house is lit up like. So when you watch like the Game of Thrones and things like that in Jack Cruz's house, we actually have that. We use that and candles. And now I'm really going to freak you out. Since it's for, for those of you listening, you got to go on YouTube and check this out. This is amazing. 
is a 1967, I'm sorry, not, a, a silver oak. Do you see all the candle wax on it? So how do you think you get that candle wax on there, Luke? Well, that's what Jack uses at night. So okay. I'm a believer in natural light. And the reason why, I want to explain to you the reason why so you get it. And the reason why people should understand this is fire has very little blue in it, has a ton of infrared. So guess what? At nighttime, since I told you red regenerates, you have a period of time where red, even at nighttime, is okay. And here's the reason why. Our retinas do not see infrared light. You have to have an infrared camera. Turns out we can't see UV light either. And do you know why that is? It's a quantum reason. Because if you observe the frequencies of light that are used for signaling, it inactivates the quantum process. Because you probably have heard of all these crazy things in quantum mechanics. If you observe the effect, it changes the result. So what has nature done? It's blinded your eyes to purple and red light so that you can't observe the effect. And that effect, it's called the quantum Zeno effect. That's how deep we get at my site. Dude, that's so trippy. It is. And, 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 and you know how deep I get into this stuff, Luke, that the reason I want people to know this is because no matter where you are, you can set a fire pit up at your house. Uh, you can have a fireplace anywhere. You can do it outdoors, indoors. But that's the stuff I use. And if, if, if since you live in L.A., what I would tell you to do is go to Home Depot and get one of those, you know, headlights that you see like uh, coal miners wear. But just get a red LED on it. And I'd be OK with that. You reading on that. Um, I just don't do a lot of that unless it's wintertime, you know, when it gets dark at 430. But even when my daughter does her homework. I'm in the kitchen. We have two UVA bulbs. You know, those are party bulbs that you've seen that make things glow in the dark with an incandescent. And that's what she does her homework under. Wow. Wow. And OK, so if that's not feasible or someone wants, you know, just needs more brightness, would the next step up then be like amber incandescent bulbs? Like that's what I, I get them on Amazon, you know, because they're decorative. So it got around that, you know. Huh? Uh, the EPA regulations or whatever that try to get rid of incandescents. You can still get them. They're just like decorative. Right. Bulbs. You, have to go, you have to go to just to the, the lighting outside of Lowe's. They still send them, you know, Lowe's and Home Depot sell them, but they're called specialty lighting. You can still find them. It's not hard to do. But I tell my members because you have to realize I'm a stickler about this stuff. I really don't want even an incandescent on afterwards because remember on an incandescent, that picture I just sent you, there's still a little spike in the blue, okay? So you want to kind of get rid of all that because here's the, the way sunlight works. Once it sets, the way it goes is the blue goes away. Now, red is still present in our environment, but where is it present? And you know this better than anybody. When you're out in the, in the, in the uh, desert, you pick up a rock, it's still pretty damn hot. You can't see the heat, but if you had a FLIR infrared camera, you'd say, damn, that's hot. And here's the thing, that infrared is still present in your environment because your environment holds it in. So I'm okay with red light post sunset for about two to three hours, but then out. And that's the reason why I'm a big stickler about even incandescence after night, because if, especially if you have trouble sleeping or you have a mitochondrial disease like cancer, autism, you know, autoimmune conditions, any, any of the ones that what I call low hanging fruit, you know, in the community that you and I serve, um, you need to let them know that that needs to be taken out. So if you do use those bulbs, here's the, the, the switch. For example, you don't realize this, but any of you who listen to me and, and Luke talk, you can go to YouTube. I'm wearing these glasses that you can't tell are blue tech lenses, but they are. They're blocking 50% of the blue while me and Luke talk over Skype. Well, I take these off, and these are the glasses that I operate to. And these block everything between 400 and 500 nanometers. So now technically, I've completely eliminated all the blue. The red still gets through these, okay? So does the greens and, and yellows, but during the day, I'm not worried about that. But when I'm working at night, I want total blue protection. Why? Because that's what destroys melatonin and dopamine, first in the eye and then in the brain. And when that happens, that's when you're gonna wind up getting wallet bobsied by my profession down the pike because those are the precursors to all the metabolic diseases that everybody hears about in the doctor's office. 
And, you know, the drug companies are making a mint off selling people drugs that can't fix this problem. Why? Because it's a light mediated phenomenon and it affects both our eyes and our skin. And we don't realize how this is tied together because guess what? Humans don't know that much about light. They don't know that much about quantum mechanics. And my job as a doctor, the way I look at it, is to teach people how to know these things. You don't have to know it as deep as, say, I do, but I, I think you'll like this little analogy a lot. We don't have to teach the hippo or the lion how to eat or live. They just do it, and they don't get in trouble. But the reason why, Luke, we need to talk to humans and have podcasts and have blogs is because we have this incredible thing in our head called the human brain. And that thing is so amazing that it allows us to break all of nature's laws. So when we break those laws that the hippo and, and lion live by, we don't realize that something as ubiquitous as the light that we live around can cause the diseases we get. And that's what makes this very counterintuitive. And when you decide to jump down Jack Cruz's rabbit hole, I promise you when I get done with you, You'll know everything you need to know about light, water, and magnetism, and then you'll begin be, be able to put it together and you become a mitochondriac. And <laughs> mitochondriac is a person who really wants to know the nth degree. Then you'll know why I'm such a stickler about the light that I use at night because I don't want any person coming to see me or talking to me on a podcast or listening to my podcast and, and getting a half truth because I felt like for the first 40 years of my life in my profession that that's what I gave people. And the reason I gave people that is because that's what I was taught in school because I didn't know any better. And then I got enlightened, so to speak, a good pun, about 12 years ago. And I've been sharing this message for the last 12 years out there with anybody who wants to learn. And, you know, my message is now beginning to resonate very, very loud because now the science is very much behind me. 12 years ago, you couldn't find this information anywhere. Now there's books written on it. There's articles constantly. I mean, God, if you go to my Dr. Jack Cruz Facebook page and just to put my name in and any topic you want, you're going to get a bing and it's not going to be just my opinion. You know, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, even seven years, it was my opinion. You know, based on me reading the science, now it's blatantly obvious to everybody. The problem is it's just still not well known, especially in your community, especially out in LA. And you know, when me and Luke first met, we met at an event with Neil Strauss and Luke's story about how he went to get his water. You know, he made the comment that people think I'm crazy to do this. And I'm sitting in the back of the room and I'm going, dude, you're not crazy at all. You're, you absolutely are like the hippo in the line. Why? Because instead of, because you lived as a zoo animal in LA because of your job, you knew that you had to do something extraordinary between light, water, and magnetism. And you probably didn't know that much about light. You didn't know that much about magnetism, but you said, shit, I know water's important. So guess what? That's the part of the stool that you hit hard. And that's the reason why I consider you, you know, a good dude and also a little bit of a mitochondriac. You still need to add the other parts, but dude, you're going to, your podcast the, the tribe that you hit, these are people that I will never be able to hit. And the reason I like doing and reaching out, you know, to guys like you is because even if we affect one or two people by listening to saying, you know what, I need to think about this whole blue light thing maybe a little bit differently, that's, dude, that's a win. That's a win for both me and you. And when people want to jump down the rabbit hole more, then yeah, come to my site and I'll split your head open and teach you everything you need to know. But here's the crazy thing. The hippo and the lion, they don't have to know this. So you know what that really means? This should make us, everybody smile. Neither do you to get it. Exactly. Well, I mean, it's like with the with the, the light piece and the sun, I, I've made this correlation that when we go on vacation, we think that we feel so good and we're so happy and relieved, maybe because we're away from our job or we're in some place that has some sense of novelty or excitement, you know, tropical island or whatnot. But I think a lot of it, or even just going to the pool on Sunday or something, or the beach, I think a lot of it is that you're in the sun. Absolutely. You know, and it's you just know, like, we like sun, you know, well, that's, there's a reason why, and there's a reason why I like the spring water that comes right out of a goddamn rock, 10,000 uh, feet up in the mountains. I mean, it's just like, I don't have to know the science. I just know intuitively my body and spirit are just like, yes, more of that. 
Well, do you want to, I, I can tell you exactly the reason why, very simply. And, and it is a little bit of science, but it's going to be the kind of science that even somebody with no background can get. In third grade, all of us learned about this process called photosynthesis, it's where we take CO2 and water, mix some sunlight, and we make sugar. Everybody knows that. That's not controversial. But what people forget is that mitochondria reverse that process 100%. So what does that mean? It means when sunlight hits us, we make CO2 and we make water. Guess what? Your mitochondria is designed to make water. So Luke, the most important water in your life isn't the stuff that you go get out of the spring. It's the sunlight that you're in builds water inside your cell. That's how life went from the, the sea to the land. That's the key. And when you begin to realize that sunlight is what builds your battery in your body called water, dude, everything changes. That's the key. And it turns out the EMF that signals that in a mitochondria is sunlight, 250 to 780. That's the reason why the stuff that Apple, Cisco, and Google makes, not so bueno for a mitochondriac. So if you're gonna live and swim in that kind of sea, you got to do a shit ton more to stay well. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What about, you know, when it comes to blue light and this technology, because I know you and I aren't giving up our, you know, Skype or laptops or anything anytime soon. What uh, about these like blue blocking screens? And now, you know, Apple's put like this uh, night shift app on there. I mean, does that help at all? You're just giving a thumbs down, listeners. Yeah, does that, Apple, I mean, does that does that help at all to like... Yeah. It helps, but that's like saying I put filters on my camel cigarettes. So let's just make it real. The, uh, the type of screen technology that you need to look into is Iris software and Iris screens. If you use that, they really take the blue out. That's the best that's out there. But truthfully, where you are, Luke, uh, I'm looking, I'm hoping that there's some entrepreneurs out there, you know, guys like Neil Strauss and his crew, that these guys start to put their money behind red uh, base screens instead of blue brace screens because I told you red already offers a huge benefit if we just made that one change in the technology arena we could help humans tremendously okay so I will tell you that we started this podcast off you know I'm, I'm, I don't like disagreeing with my host but I'm going to tell you I already told you in 2017 that I changed my life in neurosurgery and why did I do it it's because of this non-native EMF so I'm going to tell you that yes it is that big a deal now I'm going to still do maybe podcasting and this and that, but I have to tell you, Luke, I now pay people to do a lot of my social media stuff. Why? I'm not willing to trade dollars for life or time. And 10 years ago, I was willing to do that. I'm not willing to do it anymore. And I know people listening to this, they're going to be willing to make that trade. But I think the reason they're willing to make the trade is because they really don't understand the trade that they're making. And then when they do get a mitochondrial disease or they do need a guy like me, and that's when, that's when the game changes for them. You know, and I, I, I remind everybody how Steve Jobs died, okay? It's called the laptop because it was in his lap for a long time. And guess what? That's really close to your pancreas and your liver. And, you know, people don't realize that I think he knew it. If you watch – uh, his bibliography, the things that he wrote, the fact that he didn't let his own kids use his own technology. What does that tell you, Luke? Wow, See, I didn't know that. That's intense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not only that, I'll tell you something else you may not know. In the iPhone 4 and the second iPad that came out, do you know that it had an infrared sensor built into it that, that Apple never marketed? Do you know why? Because that would tell them when the device was next to their body, when you were kicking off heat, and it would turn it off. Why? Because that device stays on as a bi-directional microwave device, and they know it. The problem is they're protected by the FCC law. But the, the key crazy thing is the more non-native EMF and blue light you allow in your environment, you become an obedient idiot, meaning that you can't think as well. And that's why they're not telling you about it. And they know that you're an obedient idiot because it makes you a good customer. And that's a function of dopamine, okay? And Damn, this gets deep. This is great. It, well, it's oh, kind of cool. It's kind of cool for people to hear this stuff because when you understand how this works, the way to solve the problem is just get back in the sun because that's how you build your dopamine level up. And it's the craziest thing. You know, we've recently just had a couple of high profile deaths, you know, especially in the music business. You know, Chris Cornwell died from Soundgarden, 
And I, I released a, a blog post on LinkedIn that really, really resonated with a lot of people. And I try to explain to people that when you have a low dopamine state, you're, you get addicted to sex, porn, pedoph pedophilia, uh, food, wine, uh, drugs, and weed. And the reason why, people don't realize. Do you know there's a chemical that's made in your brain and your body when you're in sunlight called POMC, spelled P-O-M-C. It stands for a big, long chemical, but we cleave it into six different things. You know what, two, you know what one of those things is? It's called beta endorphin. You've heard about it from exercise. You know what that is? It's a natural opioid. So you know what happens when your dopamine level goes low? You don't make enough POMC. So what is your behavior? You go and use things to raise your dopamine level other ways. That's what addiction fundamentally is. So you know what that means? Cut to the chase. That means that nature built us to be addicted to sunlight because of beta endorphin. And you know what the crazy thing about beta endorphin is? It's the only opiate that we know of that doesn't cause you to be addicted to any other opiates. Wow. So nature knows what she's doing. Dude, that's crazy. You're I mean, you're talking to a former uh, opiate addict for a long time. And, you know, I got another part, I got another part for this story. That <laughs> this I'm is this is great. And the thing is, too, is once, you know, once I was able to be freed from that, then, you know, all of the other shit you mentioned, the sugar, the social media pings on your phone, like all of those right. other little dopamine you replace spikes. It on for the exactly, next. exactly. And it, here's Cigarettes, the crazy same shit, right you know. exactly it's all the same thing it's the dopamine hit you're trying to replace here's the other one is the flip side of the story we have another system in our body called the endocannabinoid system and most people know about cannabinoids thc smoke the weed so anytime somebody comes to me and say i like smoking weed you know what it means to me as the quantum clinician that they're not in the sun enough because guess what makes that endocannabinoid turns out it's sunlight so nature has figured out anybody who uses opiates and weed, they're not in the sunlight enough. So guess what the answer is? The answer is to change your environment, not to go to rehab, not to do this, just go to freaking Hawaii and sit on the side of a volcano. And th that's part of the reason why I love a guy like you because I see you do the things that you're doing when you're out in nature and you said you're a former opiate guy. Well, guess what? I don't think you're gonna go back to that as long as you keep doing the stuff that you're doing in nature, you are designed. Your best Wi-Fi signal, dude, is connecting wirelessly with the sun with your feet on the ground. And that's why I tell all my members, all my misfits, everybody in my tribe, I want them to be like the Sphinx. I want all four extremities on the ground looking to the east every morning. Why? Because it turns out sunlight is much more powerful for us as humans in the morning than at any other part of the night because that's what turns on the giant system in your pituitary gland called the, what I call the compound pharmacy. See, you can use the compound pharmacy you know, on Rodeo Drive for a couple thousand a month, but you'd be a whole lot better off using the one that's in your own brain. And what do I teach people? How to do that naturally. Because here's the crazy thing that big pharma doesn't want you to know. It's free. It doesn't cost a penny. <laughs> exactly. So that's an interesting thing about the uh, the, the uh, cannabis and lack of sun. I want to just poke one hole in that theory that because it popped in my head. What about the Rastas in Jamaica that are getting plenty of sun and all they do is smoke weed? Yeah. Well, you got to remember, what else do they do? They play music at what time? Did you have you ever seen a Bob Marley concert at eight o'clock in the morning or is it always at one or two in the at night? That's a good point. That's so good guess point. what? That this, this is the thing that people don't realize. Think about all of the guys that died. I mean, think about Carrie Fisher. What did she do? She was a big time drug addict, right? She just died of a heart attack. Where's more mitochondria in humans in your heart and your brain? She died on a plane disconnected, coming home. They found all kinds of drugs in her system when she supposedly recovered. So what did she do? What was her job? She's an actress. What is she around, Luke? Blue light, non-native EMF, since the time she was probably 10 years old. How about somebody else in your industry? Michael Jackson. What, what did he do? He went and found a crazy doctor to give him Diprovan. You know what Diprovan is? It's, called, it's, it's a chemical that we used to put people to sleep. But you know what people don't know? It's actually a mitochondrial toxin. So why did he have the heart attack? Because the drug that he needed to sleep, because he couldn't sleep because of the blue light and the non-native EMF, he used that and that wound up off in his mitochondria in his heart. See, these are the connections people don't make.
Kurt Cobain. Why was he depressed? He was in Seattle. What do you know about Seattle? There's no sun. And he's playing music on electrified guitars. The links are always there. But you know what the key thing is? We don't see them because we're obedient idiots, because we're addicted to modern things that reduce our dopamine level. Hey, My Jack, job is to make those connections for you. Jack, can you explain? We, we're using the, the term mitochondria. Can you explain to the listeners what that is? Yeah, it's pretty simple, even if you don't have a science background. We have two genomes in our cell, every cell in our body, with the exception of a couple. One is the nuclear one that everybody knows. That's where the genes are. And the other one is the mitochondria. The mitochondria you only inherit from your mom. And the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So if you think of a car, the, the mitochondria would be the battery and the alternator of the car or the engine. It's probably better to think it's the whole engine, whereas the nuclear genome is the mechanics that put the whole car together. Uh, the key thing is, is all energy flux in the cell. Everything that turns the lights on in your cell comes from a mitochondria. And the crazy thing is medicine is focused on the nuclear genome. And it turns out this genome is the most important. So that's why I use the term mitochondriac because all my members, all my misfits, everybody in my tribe, we focus in on that genome, not the other one. And that fundamentally is the reason why medicine is looking, they're looking under the wrong stone. For example, remember Nixon in 71 said, let's have a war on cancer. We spent now over close to $1.5 trillion on research. We've done nada. And you know the reason why? Because we're looking in the nuclear genome, and it turns out the answer, cancer is a mitochondrial disease. So it's no shocker why we haven't found a cure. And the reason why there's no impetus in big pharma to go that way, because, dude, this has become a billion-dollar business. Because if you're looking in the wrong place for the disease, you get to keep selling drugs that treat the symptoms and not the cause. It's very very simple. It's a very powerful model. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it would be a really bad uh, business decision to expose the actual root cause of things like that. I, I well, want to think I wanna... about how crazy it is, though. The sun is free. All you got to do right. is get your ass outside. But here's the problem we've now created, we let Google, Microsoft, Cisco, you know, all these companies create an existence. Technology doesn't bring us outside, my friend, it brings us inside. I mean, you're too young to know this. But I guarantee you there's going to be some millennial that's going to talk to their dad. When, when I was 6 to 10 to 12 years old, I was outside riding my bike playing baseball. These kids are inside doing this, dude, and texting and on their iPad and doing that. Their, their existence is so radically different than what it used to be just 40 years ago. But people today do not realize that coming inside takes you away from 250 to 780 and brings you – Right to 430 to 465. That is an alien sun, dude. And, and, and it's very apropos that I said that because I want you to think about Chris Cornwell's major song, Black Hole Sun. And you want to hear something else that's crazy about it? Do you have any musicians that are listening to this? Do you know anything about the music composition? That song was written all in flats. And do you know why he did that? Because when you have a low dopamine state, you begin to see the fractal nature of, I should say, the fractal fabric of nature. And there's another guy in your neck of the woods, in your, I would say, probably a little bit older than you, but you've heard about him, Jackson Pollock. Remember him? He was a raging alcoholic. What, would, what made him famous? He used to paint fractally. And the only way you can see the fractal fabric of nature is when your dopamine levels low. So now I just gave you two examples of low dopamine people who actually can see that fractal in nature. When your dopamine level's high, it blocks you from seeing those fundamentals in nature. That's what the sunlight does, dude. That's the reason why we see life in a movie, and when dopamine level goes low, we start to see it just like isolated picture frames, and that's when you make bad connections because you're not putting things together properly. It's very important. Two things for... I've gotten this, uh, you know, people dispute the sun thing that I know that I've recommended that that are fair skinned. How can someone who's, you know, uh, lightly complected acclimate themselves to sunlight? Because what they always say is like, oh, that's fine for you, Luke. You're Italian. You got olive skin. It doesn't because I really don't burn, you know, except if I go to Brazil or something <laughs> close to the equator. But here, I, I mean, I could lay naked in the sun all day. I just get tanner and tanner until I look like Wesley Snipes or some eventually. I don't know. But the, my, my, my ginger friends, my fair skin friends are like, oh, I can't do it. I have to wear sunscreen. And I'm like, ah, God, you're putting 
you're putting cancer causing shit on your skin going into your bloodstream because you're afraid of getting cancer from the sun that gives you melatonin that actually prevents cancer. It's like so frustrating, but I can't tell them how to do it safely. Maybe you can. Yeah, I can. In fact, guess what? As you're talking, I'm getting ready to send you another picture for the show notes. Ah, good. So you've met me, right? And you know, here's the picture coming. Uh, I want you to take a look at that yourself. Um, you know that I'm an Irish guy. I have a K haplotype. I'm very white. I have Fitzpatrick type one skin. Okay. So in that picture that I just sent you is a biohack that I did with the quality. So it turns out when you live at a high latitude, which is where Ireland and UK is, uh, you never get to see much UV light. So the reason why red hair freckles and Fitzpatrick type one skins there, you're designed to absorb as much as you can get. Well, it turns out there's something really funny on that slide I sent you. The more infrared A light you absorb, and what did I tell you earlier? All sunlight has 42% of it. So if you're naked at that high latitude, it preconditions the skin to absorb UV light better. So take a look at the slide I just showed you. It'll show you when your skin is preconditioned with infrared A light, look at you don't get erythema, you don't get burned. So how does Jack, at the 28th latitude, who lives in New Orleans, now stay out in the sun five to eight hours a day, and I don't have that problem, Luke. See, you right. now dude right. on your Rolex who can explain this to them. Why? Because I'm always in it. And when somebody tells me they have Fitzpatrick one or two skin and they get red, you know what it tells me? They're vampires. They're full of shit. They don't go in the sun enough because they're not getting infrared A both in their eyes or on their skin. So here's the crazy hack in L.A. Say if you have a job where you can't do this, remember I told you that red light doesn't get you into trouble, say from sunset to about two or three hours later, go call up four industries, go get yourself a tanning bed that's only red light. Now it's going to cost you anywhere between 30 and 100 grand, but if you get a group of your friends together or a chiropractor, they put it in their practice, 20 minutes a day, sometimes three times a day if you're really white. So how did I do it in me, Luke? I didn't spend the money on the bed. I went from Nashville to New Orleans. And what did I do? Got naked in the backyard. And that's how I build up my solar callus. And you know what causes that? The aromatic amino acids in your skin. There's four of them. Tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and histidine. And it turns out that what makes these amino acids really special, they have what we call a six carbon ring in them. You've probably heard of benzene before. Well, every one of those has it. You know what's special about those rings? They absorb UV light. So guess what? The infrared A light stimulates the water that's around all of those, and that acts as a molecular engine for you to bury more UV light within that benzene ring. And that's how you avoid the erythema. That's how I can go to Mexico at the 20th latitude next week and not get uh, red like lobster. So I'm going to tell your, me your members and your friends that tell you this, but they just proved to me that they're ignorant about light. And I'm not trying to down them. I'm trying to elevate their game. I'm trying to teach them that there's something else here because most people know that there's people that live on the equator and they do it just fine. Well, it doesn't mean that a guy with uncoupled haplotype mitochondria and, and, and really uh, light skin is going to live there. But if you know what you're doing, you can adapt to that environment. And you can do it very successfully as long as you know what you're doing. So could it, could someone who's more fair skinned also just gradually acclimate themselves where, you know, yes. they, they go out, like you said, earlier in the day, later in the day, or even solar noon when the sun's really strong, but just you, you go out for 10 minutes at first and you get the hell out and you kind of like yeah. work your way up. But you can do that, but you got to realize that the UVA and the UVB light is going to give you the erythema response. The most important thing to do. Remember I told you in the morning, there's no UV. And later in the day, not this time of the year is bad because we're talking right now around the solar, the, the solar, the summer solstice. So it's strongest now. So depending on what your latitude is, you have to make the decision. But as soon as the sun rises, six to about seven a.m. here, <clears throat> there's no UV. So that's the time for you to be naked outside. That's when you're getting 42 percent infrared A with no UV. The flip side of that is true too. the last hour of sunlight. Same benefit. Now, just for argument's sake, say where it's April. Well, guess what? Then it goes all the way to maybe 6 to 9.30, okay? It's bigger. The key thing is, remember I told you before what nature does. You're designed to be addicted to sun. Well, our modern society, our culture, 
our beliefs have brought us out of the sun. So what you call enough solar exposure, nature's telling you is not enough. When you get erythematous and you have Fitzpatrick one skin, wrong answer. That by definition, you are wrong. Your belief, your dogma, your paradigm is absolutely wrong. But here's the cool thing. When you understand how light, water, and magnetism work, then you can use a biohack, or what I call a mitohack, which is that picture that I just sent you that shows you that if you use infrared ALEDs on your body to offset your shitty lifestyle, dude, you can go out in midday sun and not get red. And you'll be like, damn. And I always tell people, building up your solar callus is like buying a brand new pair of Ferragamo shoes. That first time you wear those Ferragamo shoes, they hurt like a bitch. As soon as you wear them out, they're all nice, they're broken in. Same thing is true with sunlight. And the best way to do it is not the way you mentioned, you know, going and getting five or 10 minutes. The best way is use infrared A, know when it's present and when it's not. And that's the way you're designed to work with nature. So very interesting, Jack. So the red light <laughs> seems to be the missing link here. I want to ask you one other thing that I've heard, and I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but what about taking uh, astaxanthin as a supplement, you know, that red seaweed oil? Is that going to do anything to improve our tolerance to sun? It can, but here's, the, here's where you're going to run into uh, some of my uh, quantum rules. You're not designed to take pills. Like a million years ago, Luke, there was no pills. You know what? As that, the, the antioxidant that you're talking about, you know where it's designed to come from? Shellfish. What do you know about the book that I wrote? What's it all about? It's got an epipaleo period, pyramid in it. And what is that pyramid? It tells you that shellfish is the top. So guess what? You're designed to get it from nature. So I'm very quantum coherent with my misfits. I don't believe in pills at all. And that means pills from my profession or pills from a supplement maker. Because I always make this comment, and it rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but I think it's important for people to hear directly why I feel this way. Um, supplement makers, um, they make a lot of money off of, off of obedient idiots, people with low dopamine level, and they're banking on those people being foolish. And the key thing is once you realize that there's no shortcutting nature – and I'll explain to you why. Everything in biology, everything in a cell is a coupled system, meaning there's a positive and negative feedback. So if you take an exogenous thing that we're designed to make normally and you add it to the mix, you've just uncoupled that system. So we have uh, an, an example of this that I use in, in, with my members that I'll share with you. You know that the coupled system in nature is predator and prey. What happens when you change either the predator population or the prey population when you take it to the nth degree, they both become extinct. So I want you to think about that. If you think taking melatonin or any of the antioxidants is a good idea, you're not part of my tribe. Why? Because you don't physically understand how these things work. Now, the crazy thing, a lot of the skeptics out there will come and say, well, isn't food technically a supplement? Yeah, but what people don't realize, the entire food web is linked to what, Luke? Photosynthesis. We're back to the light again, aren't we? So that means all the electrons that are in food are programmed by sunlight frequencies. And guess what your mitochondria's job is? It's to yoke the light that comes through your eye and your skin to the electrons that go in your body. That's the reason why I famously said five years ago at the Paleo FX conference that if you live in Boston and eat a banana on December 31st, you're a freaking idiot. And, and it was not met with... Uh, a lot of a plum. People were pissed off when I said it. And I said, just because you can buy a banana in Boston doesn't mean you can eat it. Why? Because nature doesn't allow bananas to grow at a high latitude when there's poor solar light. So what did you just create there? You just created a circadian mismatch in your gut. Okay. And this is, this is a real key point. People do not know, lay people do not know that the entire food web on earth is linked to photosynthesis. So that means that your mitochondria knows that and it's dialed into that. So that means the frequencies that go through your eye and your skin, if they don't match with what you're eating, therein lies why your gut microbiome gets screwed up. It's not because of the foods you eat. It's because of the light that you're allowing 
and it throws off the software that runs the hardware in us. And that's the key. That's why I'm, I'm a really big pain in the ass to people who sell supplement boxes every month to people. I'm cool with you wanting to buy it. If you want to enrich somebody, I'm fine with that. But I want you to understand fundamentally how we work because if I can put you back in nature like you do, Luke, that's the best supplement you could ever get. And it's free and it's easy to do. The problem is we've created our lives in such a way that it disconnects us from that connection. And if I can get people to reconnect with that more, then I feel like I'm doing my job. And here's the crazy thing. You don't have to be in it 24-7, but you have to be in it enough. And you know probably when you're using opiates compared to now, you probably weren't in it a lot back then, uh, but you are now. And, and maybe that's the real reason that you've noticed a tremendous change in the way you think about things. Because, you know, when I first met you, the reason I loved you, you could see that passion you knew you were plugged into something. You didn't know all the science, and it didn't matter to you. And I, I remember thinking to myself when you were there with Ben Greenfield, I said, both of these guys, one's a lion, the other one's a hippo. And, and it's so cool to see a person turned on. Um, I just – I have to be a little bit more of a stickler with my crew because, you know, doctors are skeptics, and they want to tear you down. And they need the science. They need the sights. They need to know – that this isn't some crazy madman on the internet that's got his own ideas. But trust me, I back up everything I say with hardcore data, but you don't need to know that. You just need to know that living as a wild human, you know our friend Daniel Vitalis, the wild human versus the zoo animal, okay? Modern humans are zoo animals. And I'm trying to teach them how to go back and be their wild self. Because if you do that, you can get better. And you don't need anything extraordinary to do it, especially a pill from a supplement maker. Well, you just saved me about 1200 bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you your commission uh, at the end of next month. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting perspective um, for someone who's been, you know, very into supplements. But you know what? Honestly, I think I've I've felt better and better over the years. So I've actually toned down a lot of that where I'm just kind of doing basic stuff that I really don't feel I'm getting from food. There's one other thing with the sun exposure, though, that in addition to astaxanthin that I've heard uh, is effective, and that's chaga mushroom, which isn't a pill, but rather <laughs> you know, a tree, a medicinal tree mushroom that you, I, I boil it and make this tea and it's very high in melanin. And it's yeah. said that that makes you more re resilient to sunlight and, and the absorption of vitamin D. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I have zero problems with that because remember, that is something that grows, but where does it grow? It grows at different latitudes. So what's the difference in chaga tea? I have a good friend named David Limacher who owns a company in, in Saskatchewan and he does chaga and it grows at different latitudes. So where you buy your chaga is actually important. So for example, if you're up in Saskatchewan at the 55th latitude, it's not gonna have a ton of melanin in it. But if you buy your chaga, say, inside the 20s, which are in the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer, dude, you, you've got a way of dealing with that. I would tell you the better way to augment it is what I told you before, infrared A light, meaning right. AM light is the key but do I have a problem with chaga? I have none, none at all, because what you need to do is when you take the food in, what I'm trying to teach you even here now, Luke, so I want you to yoke it to the light environment around you. See, taking chaga from 55 and you live, say, at 15, that makes no sense at all. You know, you, you want to make sure they're yoked. That's part of the reason why I used the example with you before. Eating a banana should happen this time of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. We're cool with that. All right, because it's a long light cycle. We have strong UV light, and that's when carbohydrates grow. But the flip side of that is if this was December 21st, and you were in L.A. or I'm here in Louisiana, dude, you wouldn't catch a banana in my house at all, at all. Yeah. And that's the reason why, because guess what? That incident EMF that I told you from the sun, guess what your mitochondria pays attention to? It is counting those frequencies. And – if you make or eat the wrong thing, there's this little thing in the mitochondria called the MCU transporter. It allows too much calcium in. The amount of calcium determines what kind of free radicals you make. That's how this shit works, dude. And this thing is all controlled by light. Everything about us, 
is like a rock concert. And we don't realize that we are beings of light because we don't understand all the details. But guess what? Science ha has all these details published. My job, I haven't discovered any of this. I'm just an innovator. I take all the pieces together and sit down and can do a podcast with a guy like you and explain why eating a banana may not be a smart move in December, but it's perfectly fine in June, yeah. you know, based on where yeah. you live, you know, and I you don't understand that. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, absolutely like seasonal eating. Just again, going back to the common sense, just basic mother nature. It's like, hey, live like know. a lion, the hippo. Remember I told you, yeah. you don't. That's why I said this thing in our head, because when we go into Whole Foods in December 31st and we see a kiwi or a banana, we immediately grab it. Like, oh, this is organic. This is okay. That's part of the reason why I try to get people even off the organic thing, because that's a bad meme, a bad narrative to get. And I mean, out in your neck of the woods, it's it's horrible because people don't realize it's actually got to be linked to the light cycle. When food grows locally, I mean, you, the only way you can find out what food grows locally at your latitude is you got to go to a farmer and ask him because most people have no clue. Right. So you could solve that problem and not even research shit. Just shop at the farmer's market and whatever vegetables and fruits are there. Like in Southern California, you know, we, we get a lot of sun and there's a lot of agriculture here. So there's a lot of availability. But I know when I go to the farmer's market, there's a certain time of year when I'm not going to find a peach. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So that's a pretty that's a pretty simple where even like we have a health food store here. Well, it's actually more of a nightclub now. It's called Erwan and a very trendy spot in Hollywood. And you can go there and all of their their produce that's local is marked local. So you can guarantee that it's then in season and in mm -hmm. sync with that light cycle, right? Yeah, just make sure when you go to Irwin at night that you're not eating any carbohydrates. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, remember, there is also a diurnal cycle right, too. Right, right. I eat when the sun lights out. So that's why breakfast, you eat like a king. The next meal at lunch, not so much. And dinner like a pauper. Why? That's also tied. That's the diurnal cycle. See, we're talking circadian. Now we're talking diurnal. All these things actually matter. Diurnal meaning the time of day. The day. Right, Correct. Right, okay. We're designed to eat our biggest meal during the, the breakfast time. And most people say, well, I'm not hungry at breakfast. You know what they just announced to you when they say that? That they have a circadian light mismatch through their eye and their skin. That means that they are now night owls. They may not believe it, but they are. And it could be because they may get up at the right time, but they may be in front of a computer all day. Or they may be a day trader and don't realize that the blue light – that's in their eyes is totally fucking them in the shorts. Well, you just described the exact opposite of my eating schedule because I just have a bulletproof coffee in the morning. Uh, then I don't eat anything till about two. I have a light lunch and then I'll have like a heavy dinner at like, you know, six, seven o'clock. Well, guess what? This is this is maybe Luke Story's, you know, biohack for the second half of 2017. Right, right. I'll tell you, reverse it. And the, the, the thing is, it's probably because of your job. I know what you do. I see you out on social media, and I do think you got a blue light thing. I got to get you on these, bro. Oh, you that's need. what I was going to ask you about. That he's pointing, you guys listening. He's pointing to his um, blue blocking glasses. Are those prescription? But you've yeah, got my, orange lenses. Yeah, mine are prescription. Let me show you. I'm going to go get something. Give Wait. me, give me a break. Let me go in All my right. bedroom. I'll show you something else. Okay. Okay, so Jack just stepped away for a moment. He wanted to show me something else. Before you do, where did you get those? Uh, prescription glasses how did you get the nice orange lenses in there well th these are my untinted blue tech lenses these only block 50 percent. so when do i use these i use these when i'm seeing patients working on electronic medical record okay they're not great how do i fix that problem in between when i have a lull in my day i go right out the side office into the sun and i'm constantly doing that so People would call those smoke and coffee breaks. I call them sun breaks for me. And that's the reason I do this. So when I'm outside, Luke, I'll even put these down. When I need to see, I go like this. And when I don't, I'm getting the sun in there. So say I'm at nighttime. Say it's um, I'm in L.A. and I'm hanging out with you and you take me to that store that's so trendy on Hollywood. And we're shopping. Well, since these only block 50%. And I put those on over. Oh, nice, dude. Okay. And what these will do, like say if we were watching TV or say, you know, you took me to the studio and you want to show me or introduce you to some friends, this is one thing I would wear. But you'd say, Jack, these aren't trendy. So the flip side is if I had these in my pocket, I would just put these on. They do the same thing. Now, these are prescription, but these are blue techs, but they have a BPI tint. And the, these can be tinted by 
any uh, you know optometrist once you know what to ask for. Turns out I'm a little bit lucky because on one of my members is an optometrist and he owns a store in Michigan. So he will make these for any of my members. You know, if you just go up there and tell them what your prescription is and you can do it. But I tell people, if you don't have a prescription, the simple thing to do is go to Walmart, get frames that you like and just tint them, you know, so that way you're knocking out the key frequencies you want to knock out are 435 to 465. Uh, I tell most people if you can get 400 to 500 and that's what these are and I did this specifically in fact Tom is the one that made these for me because I use them in surgery okay and in surgery you know that my wrists are off the chain so I do rotate glasses big time now I have myopia but myopia when I started this like when I was 360 pounds 12 years ago was about seven point four diopters today with the sun and everything that i'm doing i'm now 4.25 so you can see that sunlight actually will improve nearsightedness and the reason why that happens is when you're in a blue light environment i told you the other chemical besides melatonin that's made in the eye is dopamine well what else does dopamine do not only does it make you stupid and an obedient idiot but it elongates your eye and when your eye gets elongated it's not a circle that's what nearsightedness is but it also sets you up for AMD, which is acute macular degeneration, retinal tears, and also thickens the choroid. And the choroid is actually the beginning part of the central retinal pathway that connects your retina to the leptin receptor. And you know how I got pretty famous on the internet was that whole leptin prescription. Well, it turns out this is the beginning of it. So you need to protect your eyes. So I'm going to tell you the reason why we started this whole discussion down this path is the reason that you eat less at one time and eat more at night, it's because I think you're chronic blue light toxic. And what that means is you have a blue light hazard and it's because of your job. Because I always look at you when I see you in social media and I notice your eyes aren't protected and sometimes when they are, you'll have sunglasses on. And I always tell people, the trendiest place for sunglasses are right here. <laughs> on top or, of your, listeners on top of your head, he's referring to that. Right here. Yeah, I actually don't wear sunglasses. Any, no, I know anymore. You know, I, I quit. I weaned myself off. Uh, but I, I that was leads into my next question in terms of prescription glasses, because I about, uh, I don't know, a year ago, just seemingly suddenly became nearsighted. Uh, not to the degree that not that diopter or whatever. I'm just learning this right. this terminology because it's new. Uh, I'm like a one point whatever. It's, it's not right. that bad, but I can't read, say, like a license plate, two cars in front of me. And it seemed to come on suddenly. And I was going to ask you if you thought there was a correlation between walking around at night in such a dimly lit environment and wearing my orange blue blockers. I thought it might have been caused by just eye strain from not having enough light present while I'm trying to avoid the blue light. You know what I mean? It's caused by you don't realize that you're getting more blue light. See, here's the thing that I need you to really understand. And I'm glad you brought this up. Right now, you're screwing yourself. You're making your myopia worse. You don't realize that in front of that screen, that screen is 5,700 Kelvin. That's equivalent to, to noon light. Well, okay? I, right now I have it. I have my flux program on, which is doing something to cut the blue. Because yeah, watch, you... watch what happens on video. If I let me cut it off right now and you'll see. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, let me let me disable this. Uh, so I just turned my light blue. Can you see the difference? You can. And, right. and the, the crazy thing is, though, even if you have it set on the lowest uh, amount, it's 2,700 K on the flux. Well, guess what? You know what AM light is? 1,400 to 1,600. Ah, shit. So here's what I want you to, to understand, because this is really important. It's going to be important for the people listening to this. If you do this for, say, 10 years constantly, all that's adding up. That's going to start the myopia. What happens with the myopia? Not only is the eye elongate, but the choroid thickens. Guess what? All the mitochondria in that choroid, all are undergoing heteroplasmy changes. What does that do? That sets you up for all the other chronic diseases tied to the leptin receptor in your brain. That's exactly how I got sick, you know, 20 years ago and right. led to this whole thing. So these are the things, that's what causes Alzheimer's. That's what causes Parkinson's. That's what causes all the diseases that everybody is scared the bejesus out of. So, what am I trying to tell you? You, you? you are learning something during this podcast that's huge, and I hope your members are getting it. If you know that you're not hungry in the morning and you eat more at night, that tells you that you're blue light toxic through the eye and like the skin. So how do you fix that? 
When you're on the computer, block the blue. So that's the reason why you always see me wearing blue protection anytime I'm on social media. And I don't know if you can see my phone, but I have the blue screen on here constantly. In other words, I, I have never seen my iPhone clean without this skin over the top of it because it blocks all the blue. I don't want any blue in my life unless it's coming from sunlight. Right. Why? Because I told you it's balanced by the red that's present. Right. And the two right. healing frequencies, the regenerative frequencies, are red and purple. That's the reason why when you're outside, I want your eyes getting the normal stuff. So you're right. You're in L.A. You do have a benefit. When you're cruising around, I want you outside in the sun because that can actually improve it. But if you start to notice over the next five years that your myopia goes from 1 to 125 to 15 to 17, because one of the things that you said I, I don't want to let go, this seemingly showed up, Jack, out of nowhere. Well, guess what? That's exactly how mitochondrial disease is. Didn't autism show up out of anywhere? Didn't Alzheimer's show up out of nowhere? I mean, we didn't have these things. Cancer was not common until 1874. In fact, uh, the medical school that I went to, the, the guy's name on the building is called Alton Oshner. I'm going to tell you a story that he told me my first year of medical school. It, it was the old man that owned the hospital. He said he used to tell the medical students in the 1920s when they saw a case of lung cancer, come in and see it because you're likely never going to see another case of this in your life. I want you to think about that for a minute, Luke. So here's the thing. I told you the first bulb ever made and when the power grid was built out, it was between 1879 and the 1920s. The reason why cancer wasn't common is we didn't have the stimulus that caused it. And guess what? Today, in, in 1900, colon cancer was the 37th leading cause of cancer in the United States. Five generations later, it's number two. How'd that shit happen? Well, guess what? No, Where's pun, your no pun intended. <laughs> right. Well, where's your colon? Think about where your colon is. Your colon is inside your gut. How many people do you think who get colon cancer let infrared A light go right through their belly? Remember, infrared A light penetrates 10 to 30 centimeters, okay? Everybody wants to blame it on the food, but you know I'm not that dude, okay? I'm going to blame it on the light that you allow in your environment, and I'm going to explain to you exactly the reason why it happens because let me tell you something. When you go from 37th to second in five generations, that takes Darwin and the nuclear gen genome right out of it. Changes don't happen that fast to nuclear DNA. And guess what? What are we studying? We're studying the nuclear DNA to look for the cause of colon cancer. Epic freaking failure. Why? It's a mitochondrial disease. And mitochondria all respond to incident EMF. And the type of EMF they respond best to, 250 to 780. Don't forget it. Can you tell our listeners why it's a bad idea to sit around with a laptop or iPhone or iPad on top of their genitalia and reproductive yeah. organs? You're hitting all the physics now. See, you, you wanted me to keep this simple, but I'll explain it to you. We're going to use the cell phone. Okay, we're going to use. And I want to ask because on my laptop I have something called a Hera pad, which you know they showed me a, a scientific, you know, some kind of experiment that showed that it blocked the the radiation coming off the bottom of it. So I'll sit with that on my lap if I have to. Otherwise, I set it next to me. You know, that might be a way to mitigate it. But what whenever I see like especially a woman who wants to have kids or something like sitting there with that laptop on her on her uterus, I'm like, oh, my God, stop that. You know, so what's up with that? Because I think right. I don't think anyone knows this stuff, dude. Like I say this to people and they're like, what? It's fine. I feel great. Yeah. Well, you may feel great, but your germline doesn't. But I'll explain it to you as simple as I can. And I'm going to use an analogy that everybody who's listening to this knows. We're going to use your cell phone your GPS device. Most people don't know that GPS works by Einstein's general and special relativity. So how does it work? Garmin has a satellite 38,000 miles above the earth uh, that is circling, okay? Going around really fast. And it talks to your cell phone, okay? It has to run 38 microseconds faster than the chip in your phone, okay? And the reason why, is because certain light frequencies bend under the force of gravity. It's called gravitational lensing. You don't have to know any of that, okay? But here's the key. That means the clock that's higher up has to run faster than the clock down here on Earth. Otherwise, you're gonna be off by a factor of 10. So if you're trying to find Irwin at late at night on Hollywood Boulevard and say the clock up here is slower than this one, 
you're going to be off by 100 kilometers. That means you're going to be in San Diego and you're not going to be in LA. Okay. Now let's flip the switch to biology. Your main clock, most people know, is right here in your eye called the supracosmatic nucleus, the SCN. Okay. And we've been spending a lot of time in this podcast talking about the eye, haven't we? Well, it turns out that central retinal pathway that we just talked about connects directly to the SCN. And you know why this clock runs faster than every other peripheral clock? Because it has more DHA, which is fish oil, in it than any other part of your brain. And what does fish oil fundamentally do to this clock? It turns sunlight into a higher DC electric current. So the more current that goes through here runs this clock faster than this one here. So if you take the laptop and put it on your lap, guess what it does? This clock speeds up faster than the one up here. So you become infertile or you bleed like crazy or you don't make enough testosterone and your sperm doesn't swim. That's exactly the reason why it happens. And if you do this long enough like Steve Jobs did, you'll go from having fertility problems to actually developing cancer. Why? Because this growth is sped up. That's what the clocks do. That's what circadian biology is all about. So the way we're built, the top clock always has to run faster than every other. And the reason is a physics reason. It's tied back to Einstein's general and special relativity because of time dilation. Why? Because light bends under the force of gravity. And even though you don't think you're six foot difference between your toes and your eyes make a difference, it does to your cells. Remember, you have a colony, probably about of a trillion cells, but you have a hundred trillion mitochondria in those cells. And guess how they all work? They work on a central clock and a peripheral clock, and they have to go perfect timing. And the only way to have perfect timing is the clock in here is called an op optical lattice clock. It works by light frequencies. Guess what, dude? You just stepped into my world now. So <laughs> I'm trying to hang on. I'm like, we just we just left the matrix. I'm like, okay, hang on, Luke. Pay attention, pay attention. So well, do, do, do these do these here, the laptop here speeds the clocks up distally. Okay. From this that's the reason why it occurs. And what does that mean? You're gonna be off by huge factors. Because remember, when you design to ovulate occurs at certain times of the month because of the light frequencies and the lunar frequencies that are there. For men, sperm production in the same way. Well, if those the timing mechanism's off, you become infertile. And that's the reason why we have massive amounts of infertility because it turns out not only does non-native EMF, the laptop do it, but you know what, what the single biggest reason is? Blue light. Blue light's the number one non-native EMF that leads to infertility. And none of the Beverly Hills doctors want anybody to know this. Right. Well, there's a lot of money in fertility uh, uh, drugs and, and mitigation, right? No doubt. So do these do these radiation blockers on, you know, that you can get for your cell phones and underneath your computer, do they do anything or is it just a total waste of money? It, they do something, but not enough. And here's the reason why. We got to go back to physics. And this is, again, something, you know, it's called the inverse square law, meaning the, the closer something is to you, the worse the risk is. OK, so everybody knows, like when you have x-rays, if you stand at least six to eight feet away, you, you don't have to worry too much. Well, what people don't realize, the same thing is true of blue light. The same thing is true of non-native EMF. But here's the problem, Luke. Uh, these days, every human, especially in L.A., owns about 15 wireless devices. So that means that their devices are all around you. And how many times have you seen a lady stick the phone in their bra or the guy put it in their pocket? Dude, that's like putting their dick or their, their vagina in a microwave oven and saying, hey, there's no problem. That's brutal. That, I always I always keep my phone on airplane if it's if it's on my body, always. I mean, it's just. And, that, and that's, that's the hack for it. That is actually the hack. And what I would tell you, all these blockers that people are being sold, they're being sold because they don't understand the inverse square law. Listen, your machine, when it runs, even if it's blocking it through the bottom and it's sitting on your lap, dude, it's still coming out the keyboard. Right. It's coming the screen. It's coming from so many different directions. You, you'd have to have a Faraday cage around your computer to really do it. The best way to mitigate the risk is to make sure the computer is wireless. I mean, wired, hardwired into the wall and not Wi-Fi. Anything that runs by Wi-Fi, dude, if, if we could see light frequencies, you would see that we live in a sea of non-native EMF around us. 
you know, and we joked before the podcast started, you asked me, Jack, what kind of microphone are you using? And I said, dude, you never get a chance of me putting anything with a wire on my head. Now you know the reason why. Right. Because I'm telling you, even when I talk on a phone, I don't put the phone onto my ear. I put it on speakerphone and I don't give a shit who hears what I'm saying. Why? I'm not willing to put the microwave oven to the side of my head. Oh and my remember, God. what's my day job, bro? My day job yeah. is I'm a brain surgeon. What does that tell you? Wow. Uh, I want to go back because I you, you speak quickly, fast, and there was something I missed, and that was I want to know for someone that doesn't live in Michigan or wherever you got your orange – prescription glasses what are those what's that uh that lens filter called the really orange one because yeah, a lot beautiful. of people that wear prescription glasses you know don't want to do the 50 percent right. tech that you've got or whatever but how do we get those orange ones from yeah you like can you can you can find them online yourself you can actually believe it or not um on my site somewhere there is a, a one of my members jason lorenzen actually uh wrote um uh, a protocol for you to learn how to do this yourself. You can buy the chemicals and do it at home, but it's really messy and it's not easy to do. I would just tell you to talk to your local optometrist and they can talk to their, their shop about doing the BPI. They're called BPI tints. BPI tints. Okay. Right. And there's lots of different lens manufacturers that are making blue blocking glasses, but here's a take home. Not all blue, blue, blue blocking lenses are the same. So I would tell you, there's a couple out there that, you know, some of the supplement makers are selling. We, me and Ruben have checked them with spectroscopes. They're not good enough. So the key, you want to make sure that you're really blocking 435 to 465. But I tell my members 400 to 500 for nighttime. So when you're out in LA, you really want to knock it down. If you do that, you're good. You're really, you're helping yourself. The other thing I, I, I want to make sure we also get this out. This is the one time where Jack Cruz wants you to be completely covered. I want all your body covered at night. Like you going out with skin exposed in blue light is as bad. It, I shouldn't say as bad. It's not, but it's not good. When I want you naked is when the sun's out, but I want you covered at nighttime when blue light's out. Right, because your skin has photoreceptors that pick up the blue light just like your eyes, right? Is that well, the deal? Dude, there's, a, there's another receptor in our body called neuropsin. And you know that there's all these opsins. You've probably heard of rhodopsin. And melanopsin, melanopsin is the one that's the blue light uh, 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 receptor in the eye that we're really focusing in on. This is why we're talking about the glasses so much. But there's another one that not too many people know about because we just found it in 2009. And neuropsin is a UVA receptor. And remember, UVA light usually shows up in, in daytime light. Well, it turns out that it's present in our skin and it's present in our eye. And I always catch the dermatologist with this. And I'm like, well, if UV, UV light's so bad, why is it that we have a receptor in both places? Could it be that right, that's right. Signal for something else? And it turns out it is. So that UVA receptor, believe it or not, actually gets stimulated by blue light. So I always tell my members who have Hashimoto's, one of the things that you have to be careful for, if you stand in front of a computer and you have this exposed right here and your thyroid's out, People don't realize that blue light penetrates all the way down to the fat layer. Your thyroid sits only about a half centimeter below your skin. So guess what? Boom. Dude, what? That's crazy. Yeah, well, dude. Hey, listen, science usually is. People don't want to understand the quantum mechanics of light. But Luke, you know that that's what I cut my teeth on. I teach my people these things. And believe it or not, Luke, there's now studies out that show that we can use red light lasers right through the skin to actually reverse autoimmune conditions of the thyroid. Do I have members on my site that are doing just that now? The answer is yes. Why don't you hear that from the paleo guys? Because they don't know shit about light. That's the problem. Well, because they think um, eating enough beef liver is going <laughs> to solve the problem. <laughs> True. Um, and that, that's, uh, the, that's, the, that's the thing about a half truth. You know, I always tell people the reason why I'm a stickler about being tied to nature because half truths always lead to full lies. And that's the reason why I got on before about the supplements. Same thing. You know, I, I didn't tell you this story, but I'm going to give it to you quick. When Ru I met Ruben, Ruben was spending $2,000 a month on supplements. You're talking about Rick Ruben. No, I'm talking about Ruben Salinas, who, who's the light engineer. Oh, who, oh okay. Oh, your, your guy. Okay. Because we were both at that conference and Rick right. Ruben was there. I, I made a correlation. Okay. 
Yeah. So Ruben was spending two grand a month doing this. And within four months of meeting me, I convinced him and he was still having tons of problems on all these supplements he was using. And once we got him on a light program, dude, everything normalized. That's when, that's when it was the most ironic thing. Here he is as a light engineer and he was still using drugs. And when I explained to him about the predator and prey, he goes, well, why don't we build a device that's made out of light? I said, great. I got a, a perfect idea. And here's what we do. And that's what we did. See, light is the supplement. Food technically is a light supplement. And it's tied to photosynthesis. You just have to get the signaling right. When you do that, dude, you can change everything. On the topic of light, and then I want to ask a couple other questions about things not related to light, but there's just so much. I mean, there's so much here. We could obviously have a 12 hour, you know, <laughs> a 12 hour docu series on the light. But I'm sitting here next to my, or standing here now. I'm on my standing adjustable desk for the moment. Uh, I'm sitting next to my infrared sauna. And this has become just part of my routine for the past 15 years. I've had this same unit and uh, I tend to use it a lot at night before bed. I notice that nights when I use the infrared sauna before bed that I sleep more deeply. My sleep apps reflect that it's beneficial for that. What's your take on, on infrared saunas or saunas in general? I, I love them because it's all, again, what are you doing? You're augmenting your infrared A that you're not getting during the day. Remember, most saunas give you infrared A and infrared B. We don't, our bodies are not optimized for infrared B as much. We still have an ability to do it. And the reason why is blood absorbs all the way from 600. I should say not blood, but water absorbs from 600 to 3000. And believe it or not, all of those nanometer uh, frequencies are actually in sunlight. So the reason why infrared and sauna and all that stuff works is because you're augmenting red. So I'm a fan. The only difference is, is what I told you before, too much infrared the wrong time of the day can actually uncouple melatonin. So I tell people if the sun sets at five, you're good to use that up to eight, then cut it off. Why? You want at least two to three hours where you're completely dark. And here's the reason why. Remember I told you about that neuropsin receptor in your skin? You need that thing to quiet down. Oh, shit, because I'm doing my sauna at like 11 and then going to bed at midnight. Well, oh, you're st damn. still putting yourself a little bit, but you don't realize if you do this chronically, then guess what? You just gave me another reason why you don't eat that much in the morning and you eat more in the day. See, you, you've created the shift with the light that you've chosen. And that's what happens when people don't understand how solar light is built and how the light we use is radically different. Right. Okay. And another issue with the infrared saunas, there's a lot of debate with, you know, the sauna industry as to whether the near infrared light or the far infrared light is superior. Any take on that? Yeah. Near infrared is, is better. Why? Because that most approximates, you know, sunlight. Here's another hack. If you want to do this, Luke, uh, when you buy a near infrared sauna, one of the ways you can uh, make it even more powerful is to take gold foil from Michael's, you know, the, the craft store, yeah. put it all over the wood on there. And the reason why, gold, and it has to be elemental gold. It can't be like, you know, fake mylar. Gold is a perfect infrared mirror. So what wow. does that mean? More reflection. And just so you know, because I know you'll appreciate this, this is the reason why the Egyptians, the top of their pyramids, always had gold foil on it. Because they knew when the solar light hit, they were able to get healthier with the reflection off there because it increased the effective yield of red light and sunlight. Well, that's cool, man. So, so gold foil, like, is it like aluminum foil? Like that could yeah, come in a roll like, like that? It kind of looks like gold. Like if you ever seen like artists using in their work, it's expensive, but not nearly as it would be if you had bricks of gold. Right. I, I don't want you to go out and do that because you'll have to have a fortune to do it. But gold foil, you can take and put it all over in different parts and you can increase your yield. Um, the, the flip side of that is, is that aluminum is the perfect, uh, reflector for UV light. That's the reason why you see the old ladies on the beach have the cardboard with the aluminum foil on the outside. So that's another way for you to increase the albedo effect. Say if you lived at, lived at a shitty latitude to improve the situation. Oh, that's cool. So there, cool. there's, other, there's other ways to oh, hack. Oh man, it's so, dude, it's so fun. Well, the, the saunas that I like, and I don't have one yet just because I, I was given this one as a gift and it's got really high EMFs. It's, it's a piece of shit in terms of sauna goes, but 
I, I still like it, but the clear light saunas have near and far infrared, and they have very, very low, almost undetectable levels of EMF. So those are the ones that I always recommend is clear light. Anyone listening, I'm, I've researched the shit to, you know, the nth degree. And, and to me, they're the most legit saunas. I'm just saving up to get one. They're a couple grand for a small one, you know, and as I, I said, always tell people that the best, the best sauna is the ones that are in Iceland called geothermal units. If you ever get a chance to do that, oh, go really? sit suckers dude dude if you've ever sat in a volcanic bath there is nothing that comes close you know to that i mean you got something relatively close to you in calistoga like right. calistoga. i was just there and, i was yeah, there two weeks yeah. ago yeah they have they have stuff there that is phenomenal so i just say if people want to try this out before plunking their money down go use the net nature's way of doing it see how you feel then decide you know whether you want to do a sauna but i would tell you sauna hot tub and you know, cold tubs. Those are all, those are all next level things that I teach people, and I teach them why they work. What an excellent segue. Uh, I've been, I think, since discovering your work a few years ago, been doing ice baths, uh, cold and hot exposure, you know, nonstop. I do an ice bath or cryotherapy. I'd say five out of seven days a week. People always ask me, "You're crazy. Why do you do the ice bath?" Give us like a just a short explanation about why an ice bath is good for you. Okay, this one is going to be simple. It's, it's something that I haven't told you before. Um, heat and cold release a chemical in you called HSP-70. HSP stands for heat shock protein, okay? What the heat shock protein does, it keeps the proteins in your body completely, their 3D dimension, perfect. Well, all proteins in your body are light antennas. So if you want your light antenna to be perfectly working, it cannot move in different dimensions. So it turns out that cold, one of the major things that it does, it can improve your circadian biology the more you use it just from using cold. Now, here's the crazy thing. You know, we've talked about mitochondria. You heard me use the word uncouple. What uncouple means is that you have a mitochondria that comes from a high latitude. The people that are tightly coupled, they happen to live on the equator. They have L0. Those are like the Kenyans and the Ugandans. Well, it turns out heat works better for them, Luke, but cold works better for most people with uncoupled. So it turns out heat and cold stress release this protein, HSP70. So the more blue light you live around, the more cold you need. Why? Because it can improve your circadian coupling mechanism everywhere in your body. And we talked about that at some length before when you asked me about the laptop in lap. So if you have that problem and you wanna restore your fertility, the smart move for you is to actually put your lower half of your body where your germline is in cold water and leave your top part in the sun. That's the fastest way to improve your situation. That's called the use of the Fournier effect, utilizing hot and cold stress to fix a circadian mismatch. Awesome, man. And so in terms of the ice baths, what I do is I, uh, I, I retrofitted a freezer, like a, you know, a horizontal lay down freezer that'd be in your garage. Basically got one of those from Sears, uh, built like a, some insulation around it. And then I fill it up with water and it keeps the water at, you know, anywhere between 35, 40 degrees or something like that. Would you say that's a good temperature if you're going to hop well in ice? I, I would, for most people who start out, probably not. For a guy like you, since I know that you've embraced CT big time, uh, the key temperature is between 50 and 55 degrees. So for people that live in California, this is awesome because that's the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> that's it. That, when, I, when my bath warms up and it gets up to 50, 55, it's like, it's boring. It doesn't seem to do anything. I mean, if maybe for someone who's starting out, but if you, if you acclimate to it, what, what would be like the ideal temperature? Well, that is the ideal temperature based on the research. If you go lower, it, it truly means that you have, you're really doing well. Most people don't need to go that low because when you go below 50 degrees, that's when you run the risk of getting hypothermia. So you're not going to recommend that for a newbie. That, this okay. is, that's what I call deep CT. I don't talk about that kind of stuff publicly because as a physician, you can get in trouble with that. But the people who are high level athletes, people who are like Navy SEALs, things like that. That's where I teach them how to use that. Can you stay in water between 28 and 35 degrees for a really long time once you're adapted? The answer is yes. Is it quite healthy for you? It is, but it's not healthy for somebody who hasn't cold adapted first. Okay. Okay. That has to happen. 
Cool. That's that's great because I'll invite people over to my ice bath and it's 35 degrees and I'll sit in there for 10, 15, 20 minutes and just hang out and meditate, you know, and they get in. They're like, ah, ah, they freak out, you know, and I say, just get in for 10 seconds, you know, and get out. But that's that's good to know. Maybe it's a little extreme for someone who's just starting out. It is. It, and I tell people the easiest way I have a CT protocol on my blog. You can read it. It's very simple to do. It doesn't take long to adapt to the temperatures you're talking about as long as you do it the correct way. Uh, you did mention cryotherapy. I'm not a fan of cryotherapy for one reason. Um, the way water releases heat, it's 24 times more effective in water than it is from the nitrogen gas you get. So when people are trying to save money to do really cool mito hacks, I would tell you go to a tractor supply, get yourself a metal tub, put it on the ground, use ice. That's the easiest way to do it. Cryotherapy to me is, it's okay. You're getting a benefit. Any amount of CT helps, but it's not as effective because it's gas versus liquid. So the cryotherapy that I go to here in Hollywood, it's at a place called Next Health. And I do it just because it's it's fast and it's convenient and it's right across from my yoga studio where I'm there almost every day. They don't use the nitrogen. They use cold air. Yeah, and, you can use both. And but I, I, I like it better because it for some reason it just feels more natural they turn on the the jets man the fans and it's like i feel like i'm outside in a snowstorm versus well, that weird gas and you know you can breathe in there and it's whole body I, I i prefer that do you have any opinion on that being uh, superior to the nitrogen or is it i, I don't i don't think when it comes remember gas in terms of chemistry gas yeah. is gas is gas what you're really interested in not is the gas it's actually the thermal change and gas is not as effective as liquid water right. liquid water the only thing better than liquid water is metal but you know that you do not want to put your tongue next to <laughs> yeah, coal yeah. because you'll get stuck to it and yeah. that's the reason why but you know i mentioned this to people plastic surgeons now are using cold plates to get rid of people's fat you know it's called cool sculpting so that's the reason they don't use water and that's the reason they don't use gas they're using the metal to do this and if you know what you're doing, it can be very effective. But again, that's one of those other things that I don't advocate to people across the internet because most of them don't have the knowledge that I have. Uh, this is something that, you know, when we do live member events, these are the kind of things that we talk about. Right. You know, the crazy model hacks, like how do I biohack, you know, being up all night doing craniotomies? Well, yeah, I do some pretty stupendous things, trust me. Right, right. Okay, cool. Well, that's that's good to know. And then, in terms of uh, in terms of being grounded, you mesh you mentioned uh, you know stepping outside into the sun and making sure you get you know your uh, extremities touching ground. What do you think about you know this has kind of been a popular thing in the health world, grounding and earthing. And then there's these technologies, these you know you can get these sheets and um, little pads that go under your computer so that you can kind of stay grounded all the time. Do you think there's any validity in the, in the grounding technology that's out there? Uh, here's, here's where I'm going to tell you the flip side. Again, this is where we get back to the supplement maker. Anybody who's making stuff, you need to check the claims. So the easiest thing to do is just take your shoes off and get in the grass. The reason for that, the sun is a cathode ray. Each planet's an anode. Anytime light comes and hits a planet, it releases free electrons. That's the photoelectric effect. So your feet have sweat glands on them. That's the reason why you're designed to absorb those electrons. You're designed best to absorb the most sunlight wirelessly when your feet or your extremities are touching the ground. That's the reason why I always tell people, I want you to think about the Sphinx. You're connected, you're plugged into the earth while you're wirelessly connected to the sun. That's the best way. Now, grounding sheets, any things that you have to plug into the power grid, absolutely, I, am, I will never advocate for that. And the reason why is the, the, the way grounding works in biology, that's a DC electric current. We turn sunlight into a DC electric current. Anything that's plugged into the power grid works on an AC current, meaning that it's, it's modulated. Anytime it's modulated, that's setting you to get a dirty electricity. I will never advocate that for that. And I don't care how much they tell you that, you know, oh, it's safe. When you do your own testing, you'll find out that most of the marketing claims are full of shit. Okay, so with my grounding sheet, what I did, this is this is good. I love this stuff because I talk to people like you and then there'll be shit that I've been doing for years, you know, and then someone's like, are you crazy? Don't do that anymore. It's dangerous. And I don't want to recommend anything to my listeners or anyone that is not 
backed by science. But here's what I do with my grounding sheet is I have it a wire running out my bedroom window and it goes into the actual ground with about a foot long metal spike that's in a piece of wet dirt that's always wet because the sprinklers is that you think that has some validity? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, if you ground that way, technically you're grounding the way you're supposed to ground. I, I have zero problems with that. But most of the stuff that's sold is plugged into the power system. Anything within the power grid by definition is bad. And if you want to discuss why that's the case, it's very simple. Our power grid oscillates at 60 hertz. Your mitochondria, the inner mitochondrial membrane, oscillates at 100 hertz. So I want you to think about that for a minute. It's close to the second harmonic. The real problem for people is when they live in Europe, their power grid oscillates at 50 hertz. That means the second harmonic is 100 hertz. That's the reason why electromechanical hypersensitivity is much more problematic in Europe than it is in the States. But guess what? We have found out that that 60 hertz oscillation tends to link with more cancer and more autoimmune conditions. And that's the reason why we get these different diseases in different parts of the world, because we don't realize that the power grid isn't consistent across the planet. And that's the reason why the epidemiology of non-native EMF is so hard for people to really you know, pin down. So I would tell people, your real goal, the place that you sleep, what I recommend my members do, is you hire an electrician to put a kill switch right next to your bed. So wherever you sleep, that, that room, has no power going to anything in that room at night. Awesome. That's, that's, yeah, that's really good advice. I mean, I, you know, I do a lot to mitigate this stuff. I don't like, I don't even use the Wi-Fi in my house. Everything's hardwired, for example. So there's, you know, over the years I've kind of made my place, but I live in an apartment. So even if I don't have Wi-Fi or I want to shut, you know, I can go to the breaker and shut off the power to my bedroom, but it's like, the whole I'm getting 35 Wi-Fi signals. So, you know, I, you know, it's it's difficult. I mean, that's right. that's city living. You know, that's the disadvantage of, of living in a place that's not remote. Uh, well, that's also, the reason why you do what you do for your water. That's why I said you make yeah. up, you make things up by going to extraordinary lengths to get your water. And see, that's that's what I want people to hear. I want people to know that we, every time we do something, we're making a trade off. And, you know, your trade off is. Yeah, I'm living in LA. This is how I make my living. This is what I do. But I want to tell you, this is the other things I'm doing. Yeah. And that's, that's why I like a guy like you, because you know what? You're not trying to sell people a line of bullshit. You're saying, look, I know some of the things I'm doing is wrong. Just like I, I told people, look, my job, I know is a big problem. You don't have to tell me. I get it loud and clear. But we need to talk about these things so that when somebody listens to this, who doesn't have a big background, say, you know, I never thought about that. Maybe I need to do a little bit more because say I am Rick Rubin. Or say I am Neil Strauss, and I, I need to do things that maybe normal, ordinary people that live in Uganda don't need to do. So why would, uh, in, in terms of the EMF exposure from cell towers, cell phones, Wi-Fi, uh, smart meters, all the stuff that we're getting bombarded with, why would living in a high rise in New York City, you know, on the 38th floor be worse for you than living, say, in L.A. on the first or second floor? Well, that's simple. It, it goes to all the things that we already talked about. Why did Carrie Fisher die in a plane? She already had a mitochondrial disease uh, that we know of from all her drug addiction and low dopamine state. So she just stressed the system. Well, where's her mitochondria? Density in her brain and her heart. So anytime you disconnect from Earth, you don't have that connection to Earth. So the higher you go up, the worse the effect is. That's the reason why people who fly a lot, like business travelers, they get what? Pulmonary embolus. You know, uh, why, do, why are pilots getting sicker and sicker? Not only are they chronically disconnected, they sit in a cockpit around all the avionics. So I have a blog out on my, my uh site called the jet lag prescription. You know what a mitochondriac does when they fly? They take their shoes off and put their foot directly on the metal stanchion in front of it. That's okay. Okay. Check it out. Check it out. I was, I was doing that. And then I got the idea to take a, a wrist grounding strap and plug it into the ground of the outlet. Am I tripping or is that just as good? No, it's not. It's bad. Ah, because shit. What, what, what <laughs> oh, you, man. I thought I had it figured out. Uh, the reason why is because you're now plugged into the electric power grid of the plane. So here's the crazy thing. Because all the avionics in the plane have to be grounded while it's flying, it turns out if you just make contact with something metal that's bolted to the substructure of the plane, 
and it turns out those metal stanchion where you put your feet are, that works. Okay, but you're saying definitely do not plug into the grounding plug with the strap on your wrist. Dude, all you got to do is put a voltmeter in that outlet and you watch it and you'll be like, oh my God. Because basically what you just did is you, you basically plugged into their power grid. Shit, okay. What about another thing I bring on the plane just to annoy people and try – because I get – dude, when I fly, I get destroyed. I, more than anyone I know, flying – Now you know why you get destroyed because you're plugged into the goddamn <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But even, even before that, that was a way that I was attempting to mitigate. But another thing I do is I bring my biomat. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what this yeah. is, but it's like an infrared kind of amethyst heating pad essentially. Do you see any benefit or detriment to that practice? I already told you. Anything that's infrared, as long as it's not run off any kind of EMF, helps right. because what does that do it builds the regeneration programs up that's great but i would always put my naked foot on the metal before i'd even use that right. or if you want to do one and the other I, i'm fine with that yeah. but infrared is always helpful because the key red light chromophore in every mitochondria is a is a cytochrome c oxidase and the other one big one is blood blood is 93 percent water and remember, in, in a cell, 99% of the molecules in a cell are water because water is a small molecule. It's only H2O. Right. Okay, perfect. And then in closing, I got a couple questions that are unrelated to any of that. You know, And I know you don't emphasize the food thing. It's all about the light, water, and magnetism, which makes perfect sense to me. But if you were going to recommend the three healthiest foods, what would they be? Uh, that's going to vary by where you live. So for example, if you're inside the twenties, coconut would be on the top of my list. But remember coconuts don't grow outside the twenties. So you're talking, to, you're talking about longitude and latitude, right? Right. Yeah. Talking about tropical Capricorn and cancer. So this time of the year where we are in the Northern hemisphere, coconuts would be fine. Um, uh, another healthy food, uh, bok choy is pretty much high on my list. I'm a big fan of that. And probably the, the single best thing that everybody should eat as much as they can, especially in a blue lit microwave world, oysters. Right. Raw is better than cooked. I've heard you talk about oysters before. I think I think actually I can credit you as the guy that made me start eating oysters because I like them, but they're not like my favorite tasting food. But uh, I, I believe you said something about them having a really high level of DHA. Is that am I right? Sure. And, and minerals, selenium, zinc, things like that. They have everything that a mitochondriac needs. Why? Because the things that go screewad in a mitochondria from blue light, non-native EMF, happen to be the voltage-gated uh, calcium channels, magnesium. Everything is tied through this interaction. And I don't want to get too much into that because it is high-level stuff. Yeah. But just know that if you eat oysters consistently, uh, you'll be doing yourself a benefit. I tell people, when you eat a dozen oysters – is equivalent to eating five pounds of grass-fed liver. Wow, awesome, man. And then in terms of eating fish in general, every time I recommend that people eat wild fish as part of their diet uh, for, you know, the uh, fatty acids and all this kind of, you know, the good nutrients that they have, everyone always balks about the heavy metals. So I always say, well, drink, you know, eat sardines or wild salmon, like smaller fish lower on the food chain. Is there really a heavy risk with the heavy metals? And no. does it depend on how you methylate? where one person can handle a heavy metal load when another person can't. What's the deal with the danger of fish? You're, you're, now, you're now getting into the areas that really kind of piss me off uh, because this, <laughs> Perfect. Is bad, this is bad information that people have gotten from the functional medicine doctors. Look, you, heavy metals are a problem for people with low redox. What does low redox mean? It means that your mitochondria doesn't make enough water. That means you're not in the sun enough. So you always hear functional medicine doctors, well, if you have methylmercury in your body, you need to detox it. In my site, my tribe, we redox before we detox. Why? Because when your mitochondria is able to work well, you get rid of just about everything you possibly can. And that includes uh, methylmercury. So I don't follow that part of uh, functional medicine because I think – they're just not deep enough. They, their science is on a surface level. And I promise you, when I get off here, I'm going to send you something, again, by that side message that you can use. I have a Google Scholar link that gives you all the, the level detail. Mercury and seafood 
is not a big issue as long as your redox is good. Now, if you tell me you have three autoimmune conditions and you had melanoma and you got myopia, yeah, I'm going to tell you don't eat tuna or swordfish, eat sardines. Why? Because the predator fish, you know, have the highest levels. But I'm going to tell you this. Tuna and sardines are better than the gra best grass-fed meat one can buy. Wow. There's okay. no replacement for seafood for a mitochondria, especially – when you live in a blue lit world. And here's the crazy thing. The more blue light and more non-native EMF you need, the more seafood you need. The less you do, the less seafood you need. And, and the reason for that is what I told you before about that clock in the eye. That clock in the eye constantly needs DHA in it, especially when it's blue lit. And I mean, dude, I've written extensively about the details and I don't want to go into it. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, we'll we'll send links to your site because I know you got a million blog posts on this stuff. I just wanted to get a little taste of that. And then lastly, on the fish thing, do you think there's any truth in in the speculations that the Fukushima radiation has leaked into the the sea life on the west, you know, in the Pacific Ocean? Yeah, that's that's more bullshit. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I mean, you know, no one has a Geiger counter to check their fucking salmon. You know what I mean? But it's like I don't know. A lot of radiation went into the ocean. There's fish out there. You, you just never know. You know? Yeah, bro. I just found what I'm gonna send you. I'm just gonna I'm gonna send you the radiation and the mercury thing together. Okay, good. It, people don't re realize that radiation is actually hormetic, and when I mean that, it's actually a stressor that helps. So here you go. It's coming on the side right there. Okay. You got it all. Perfect. Um, you, you can put that in the show notes. It even gives a link to several of those things because I get asked this question all the time. But here's the key thing uh, that I really want to leave with. If you get out in the sun and you're connected to the earth, you can repair your mitochondria so that nothing you face. Remember I said before that you could eat shit on a shingle. If you want to put mercury on that shingle, even that can be overcome you know, within reason. Obviously, I'm not right. telling you to pour mercury all over. The point is, is that your system is built in an amazing fashion. The problem is we don't understand the key to making the whole system work is being in sunlight connected to the earth allows your mitochondria to make water. You make electricity from that water utilizing sunlight. And that is the key to charging your battery that drives your life. When that battery fails, you get sick first, and then you die. Okay, noted. Uh, I, I said that was my last question, and I got to go, and I know you got to go. But I just remembered when I tested for my heavy metals, I'm cool with mercury, cadmium, all the rest of them. But for about three years, I've had multiple uh, urine, po pre and post heavy metal tests, and I'm like off the charts in lead. Any recommendations on how to get that out or if that matters? It's actually the same. It's the same issue, but okay. that – tells me that if lead's not going away, then it means it's chronically in your environment. And I would tell you the number one thing I would say in your case, you live in LA, lots of people have cars from the 80s and 70s. Gasoline is probably the number one thing. You're breathing that. So it may not be lead paint. Uh, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, the Southwest tends to have more of this because older cars are there because they don't rot as much. Like down here, dude. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah can't have a 69 Chevelle here without a shit ton of body work because it rusts out because of the humidity. But see, guess what? Down in Southern Cal and Arizona, dude, you guys have way more levels of lead in your air than we do for that reason because people are still burning the shit gas. Okay, noted. Uh, in closing, you've taught me tons of stuff on today's episode. I mean, this has been one of the most epic interviews I've ever done. It's going to definitely be a two-parter because we've, we've gone long and I'm thankful for your time. Uh, I've learned a lot. The audience has learned a lot. Who have been three teachers that have influenced you, whether it be a book, a philosophy, uh, someone who personally trained you, anything you want to name that people might be able to go look up and, yeah, and learn my, some more from? My three mentors in my life are Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and Einstein. Uh, the books that I would tell people to read, the first one, Gerald Pollock's The Fourth Phase of Water. Second one would be Roland Van Wyck. Uh, life or i should say light sculpting life and probably the third book i would tell you to read is a book that's recent called cosmo sapiens by john hans okay. it tells you exactly where we really are in science today not the stuff that most people believe awesome all right and lastly where can we find you and your work you've mentioned your tribe and your members like let's send some people over to find more of what you do 
you can find me at jackcruise.com. That's spelled K-R-U-S-E. I have a blog there. I also have a forum. I write extensively on my Dr. Jack Cruz Facebook page, which is open. I also have a book called The Epi Paleo Prescription on Amazon. And I also invented uh, a light and cooling device that fits on your wrist called the Quantlet. You can find out more about that at thequantlet.com. Um, that's pretty much me. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, dude. We've covered some great stuff. Very powerful interview. And I look forward to speaking to you again. All right. Take care, Luke. It was All good right. talking. Yeah. See you soon.